All right, what's up, me Dwelle podcast listeners? Stuart Anderson here with just a short introduction before we get on to the real podcast. We have Chris Mogridge from Mercury Wheels, the CEO, the owner of the of the company, on with us today. Today, and he talks all about wheels, everything about research, what they're developing, what's in the works, how their wheels are built, how their wheels stack up against other wheels, and uh, we try to get Chris to be as honest as possible about what makes a good wheel when you're in the market. So hopefully you enjoy the podcast and the questions that we ask him. We see Mercury as a long-term partner. We're so grateful for all they do for the team in uh, the form of discounts, but also in the form of just support. They are a local company and uh, they're always trying to partner with us and provide us the things that uh, will make our team better. So huge shout out to Chris. He's the one that connected with us about being a sponsor and about providing the team with resources. So thank you, Chris. Thanks all you for uh, listening. No real updates or, uh, or announcements to make. So we'll just get right into the podcast. Thanks for listening. Bye. All right. Welcome, everybody. We are excited to be uh, on this new episode of Me Dwell A Podcast. Super grateful to be with you guys. We've got an awesome uh, guest today. Uh, I'm going to let Chip. Chip will handle all introductions. Uh, <laughs> so I'm on here with Spence and Jake. And our super surprise guest, um, we're really grateful to have Chris with us uh, from Mercury Wheels. So um, no real announcements other than the fact that kit orders are open for the team. So um, I don't know, you guys, should we do another kit? I mean, this kit order is open. Should we do another one in the summer or is this, are we wrapping this up? Is this the ending of spandex? No, no I, I would say there's three again. Um, so one more get order. <laughs> so order save your, your money for the white. <laughs> yeah. So order your stuff. It'll be open, I think, till uh, May 17th or 18th. Uh, a lot of uh, good summer stuff available for you. So if you've got questions, um, happy to help. Any questions you've got about kits or gear or anything to buy. New Super Thermal is available. If you've ever bought a thermal vest or thermal jacket, the front of this jersey is like the thermal vest or jacket. It's like windproof. And then the back of the the back of the jersey is the normal thermal. So it's like if you are deciding to go out into weather that you probably shouldn't be riding in, this is the jersey that you're gonna want to wear. So anyway, it's good, good, good piece of equipment. So yeah, get your orders in. Anything else, dudes? Yeah, exciting first kind of team morning right out yeah. this morning that mm -hmm. was uh, mm -hmm. warm enough and fun to cruise up emmy so yeah uh, chips right we had a good first uh it, it was crazy like the thing that's wild is dude remember we didn't ride like together up immigration last year at all it was yeah. being paved plus covid like we did not mm -hmm. do that more than one or two times last year so that was, that was fun to be back um back in the old stomping ground so yeah Yep. Jake, what, what were you going to say? You're back. Oh, we're good. I just said there, we had a couple of new guys this morning, which was fun. So it's always good to see new guys. Yeah, we had Ben Brooks. Dean Walker was there. Who else? Who else was new? I would like to call Paul Watson an oldie, but a goodie, actually. <laughs> new. Paul yeah, Paul was there. Dude, man, he's so strong. Cool. Well, Chip, I'll uh, maybe turn the time over to you. You can introduce Chris and our topic. You got it. Um, all right. Do it. You got it. You got it. Um, we're introducing uh, Chris Mogridge from to the podcast today. Chris, uh, over the last three years, all Madueli listeners, the, the Madueli team has worked with Chris as he's uh, developed his wheel company. We, we've gotten to know um, we've gotten to know Mercury a little bit more and more and more. Chris is the founder and CEO of Mercury Wheels, and they are local to Utah. Um, they've been based in Ogden and, and Mercury has provided uh, ongoing products for in their product for large businesses. Everyone here locally knows backcountry.com um, as well as to teams like Midwelly. Uh, in 2020, the Midwelly team members started to uh, dip their toes into, hey, check out this wheel company, Mercury. And that was in 2020 with some very strong feedback especially um, some of the gravel wheels and the gravel racers were loving them. And then in 2021, um, we have had a number of uh, team members outfitting their bikes with their road wheels. 
Um, so Chris is a cyclist himself. He's passionate about the industry and uh, we're excited to have Chris on today talk about his business. Uh, last time we talked, Chris, gro growing into even Europe here in the next little bit. And uh, we're going to have Chris ride with our team a little bit this year yes. as well. Yes. So <laughs> it's, it's hard for Chris. Chris has mentioned it's hard when you work on wheels from morning until night to wake up at 5 a.m. and jump on a bike. That, <laughs> it's, even, it's even more challenging. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, guys. I'm, I'm glad to be here. You know, Chris, one of the coolest things about uh, Mercury was um, one of the first calls we ever had where you said, we just want to work with a team that's local because we're partners, like we're, we're in the same neighborhood. And that was one of the coolest introductions we've ever had. And I said, well, what do you want from us? And you said, nothing. We just want to work with you guys, which was one of the, so cool. So thanks for being on. It's awesome. Yeah, you bet. And you know, the funny thing is I, I, I found you guys on, uh, through Instagram and you know, you're, you guys do an exceptional job with your kits. You guys look pro. I mean, everything's good about it. And the, the, the pictures are cool. You know, I, yeah. I just enjoyed it. And so I started really looking at it. I'm like, wait a second, you know, this there, and this is back when we we're, I was still living up in Ogden. And I was like, wait a second, that's, that's down in Salt Lake. That's, I know these roads. <laughs> so that's when I reached out and I was like, man, I'd love to work with you guys. You guys are just, you seem like a quality uh, group of, of folks and, and people I could ride with. So that's, that's the reason we reached out. That's cool. Nice. Awesome. Chris, it's fun to talk wheels specifically. When you talk about a bike, there are so many uh, elements within uh, a fully built bike, but today we get to just focus on wheels and that is going to be so fun. Um, the wheel industry over the last, let's call it uh, 15 years, we have just seen it evolve in a major way where you once you once purchased a bike and what wheel set came on that bike was what you rolled oh, yeah. with. And then it was like, hey, fast forward a little bit to today, I'm getting this bike, but what wheel set are you getting to go with <laughs> that bike, you know? And uh, wheel sets have become the differentiation of, um, the cost between the build of your bike uh, or the it's it's the main upgrade to your bike um, and we're now seeing it be a you know a, a swing in two thousand to three thousand dollars one way or the other on a on a different on a different built bike so um, Chris talk to us about a little bit about the evolution of what you've seen over the last uh, as you've gotten into the industry Wheel you bet. Specific. Yeah, it's, it's been kind of a fun ride where, uh, so 12 years ago when we, we first started uh, Mercury Wheels, we, we started primarily with road because that's what I knew, you know, so, you know, do, do things what you know about, you know, don't get into things that you're, you're kind of guessing at. So that's the reason we started with road, uh, road wheels. So we sponsored a, a pro team uh, back then, it was called Kinder Pro Cycling and they were division three crit racers, did a pretty good job. And they gave me some pretty good uh, feedback on, you know, what we did with wheels, what we need to do with wheels. But the, the key to it back then, it was all tubular. And the carbon clincher was just coming into, um, uh, coming into the, the industry. Now, the, the carbon clincher from 12 years ago, it's a I mean, it might, it's a totally different wheel set now or, or a, a rim, if you will. Um, the, the amount of technology that's gone into specifically the resins on the, the carbon wheels uh, has improved dramatically. So, so, so back then it was, it was how light can you make the wheel? It didn't matter how wide it was. It's just as skinny as possible. So you'd have a 13 millimeter inner, uh, you know, inner, and that was fine. Cause you're, you're rolling 23 millimeter tires and, that's what just that's what we knew and so as the the wheels evolved to you know a little bit wider uh the tubulars got kicked out because you know there's nice road tubeless uh, versions or just tubed uh versions the the tires are really nice like uh the last set of tires i bought were a nice pair of vittorias that had 320 tpi for a clincher and you know what that means is they're really supple so they they feel good they're comfortable they, they ride better than a tubey which is one of the reasons that 
the old school guys would always ride tubulars because they felt good. You know, they yeah. just were a high quality tire, but it's, it's a pain because you have to glue it. And when you flat, you're out a hundred bucks and people got you know sick of it. And, you know, me is, I'm one of them. I, I, I like to ride tubies at some point, but you know, back in the day, but mm -mm, not anymore, man. I don't, I don't even bring tubulars in. Right. Yeah. That is one that has, we saw come into the industry, be the hottest thing and now kind of taking an exit. Um, uh, and um, now we're kind of seeing the new version of tubeless, you know, come in even into the road bikes, which is, which is fun. Chris, we're going to start and ask this question with you. How th this is, uh, you kind of have a, um, you have to find a niche inside of the wheel industry. Um, from the marketing perspective, the, the demand for the, the, the baddest, best wheel, um, how did you decide to go into a competitive industry like wheels of, of anything else? How, talk, talk about your background there the engineering background yeah absolutely so uh so let's let's get back to we'll have to rewind a little bit 12 years ago now 12 years ago there wasn't a lot of wheel companies out there there was the main people was zip reynolds easton um richie a little bit and head and envy had just started i mean they were they were in their infancy at that point so competition wise, it wasn't that bad. And that's the reason I decided to, uh, you know, toss Mercury's name into the hat with, with the cycling, I, I'm sorry, with the wheel industry, you know, in specifics. And so at, at that point, you know, fast forward to now, you know, there's a ton of wheel companies out there. Um, but I, I just always like the wheel side of it because for a simple, uh, for something so simple like a wheel that you would think would be simple because there's only five parts to it. There's the hub, spoke, nipple, rim, and the actual build. So there's only five pieces to it, right? So it should be easy. There are so many, you know, things going on with that wheel all at one time that it, it's the hardest thing to manufacture and engineer because now back it up 12 years ago, it's all rim brake, no no disc brake on the, on the road side. So you had to do it, you know, heat dissipation when you when you grab the hold of the brakes and the the uh the you know the the, the brake shoes hit the brake pads hit the, the rim it heats up when you're descending um now remember the again back then tire pressure was you know at and i, I was riding vreda steins back then and it was like 150 160 psi yeah. <laughs> so you had to yeah you had to so so you had a heat dissipation issue, you know, with, with those, those rims heating up to, you know, 300 degrees. And then all of a sudden you have 125 to 160 PSI at that same spot pushing out. And then you had the spokes pulling, you know, to keep it all tension. And then you had to worry about impact. So if you're, you know, cruising down the hill and you see a, there's a pothole or a manhole that's, that's up a little bit, bam, you hit it. You got to worry about that. So, and then to, to, to further it, that bicycle is always breathing and, and it's a living, breathing, you know, thing. So as your, 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 your tire touches the pavement, your spokes actually detention right there. And then the opposite side of your wheel, it picks up this tension. So it's always, you know, in, in the, it's, it's always in a state of flux. So there, there's a lot to it and it's, engineers hate it. Let's put it that way. Yeah, man. And, and then coming to Utah, as you mentioned, it's fun. It's fun for cyclists here to have envy. We've seen Reynolds. Reynolds has recently moved their headquarters out of Utah, but um, Mercury, uh, envy, and uh, you're able to try and true them here in some of the best uh, uh, areas of cycling in the, in the country, we would like to say. Absolutely. And that was one of the reasons we moved out here is, I mean, it's, it's the, it's a, an awesome test, uh, testing, um, uh, field, you know, it's just, you know, you have, you have the cold weather, you have really hot weather, you have uh, a sense, you have descents, you got, you got everything. And the greatest part is, is guys like you, where I'll bring in a new set of wheels 
and they, they need to be tested in real world. You know, the, the factories say, you know, it meets certain standards. We, we, you know, stick it on the drum tester and, and, and find out, you know, how good it is, but the best case situation is tested in the real world. And, and in my mind, up and down mountains, because you're putting a lot of torque, sustained torque going up those things and then coming down, man, you, you, you have to hit the brakes, you know, otherwise you're, you're going to cook a corner and, and, you know, not, won't be a good day. And so that's what I like about this area is, is, you know, it's beautiful one, but two, it's, it's a, a great testing area. Yeah. Um, Chris, everyone here listening, I think would love to get into the science a little bit about, you know, is it, um, is it the company that has the most uh, R and D uh, to be able to develop a wheel that can that can really shout like, "Hey, we've got the best wheel set," or is it the best engineer like you that can say, "No, I'm trust me, one person has to be smarter than the other to develop uh, the best wheel set." And um, so, so how do you? We gotta, we gotta know it all. Craftsmanship. Is it the craftsmanship? Is it the materials? Is it, Chris, you gotta be honest. Just open book right now. Come on. <laughs> Absolutely. Open Komodo here. So, <laughs> yep. so, so basically, um, you know, and you asked the question earlier and I didn't really answer it, but back, you know, back a few years ago, um, you know, there's, there's the envies and the zips that are, that are highly engineered and their marketing tells us this. And then you have, uh, you know, like in, back in, you know, years ago, Easton and Reynolds were, you know, they, they were good wheels, but they didn't really have the, the marketing to, to, you know, the, to, to substantiate to the, the end user that they're, they're high, high pro, you know, really high, fast wheels that are lightweight and everything. So basically we came in and I mean, here's the God's honest truth. I, I didn't have the money to spend on the marketing side of it. And I always, you know, my business background is, uh, or mindset or philosophy is, I try to build the best wheel I possibly can or product I possibly can and charge a fair price. And I figured if I can do that, then people will jump on it and people will realize it's a good set of wheels. They don't really have to buy the the envies and the zips and, you know, the really, really high, high priced ones. Now, don't get me wrong. Those are good wheels. And I do, you don't have to spend, get some nice, uh, nice wheels. And so about two or three years ago, I approached um, one of the, or, or the engineer for rims in the art industry. He actually designed the first carbon clincher. He was, he's like the, he's like the, the godfather of soul, man. He's, he's like James Brown for, for soul, man. He's for wheels. I mean, he's, he's it. So he and I um, got together and we, we designed what's called the A5. So it, it actually is no kidding the fastest wheel out on the market. Like we proved that in wind tunnels and the CFD. So if you look at like, uh, you know, like, let's say I'll pick on zip right now, the 404 Firecrest, really good wheel. It's really fast. And then all of a sudden they pivot away from the 404 Firecrest, and they go to that the, uh, the NSW, that whale tail looking thing, which is a good wheel, but it's not very aerodynamic. Their 404 Firecrest is actually faster than that. So, you know, getting back to that marketing thing I mentioned, you know, they're, they're the best marketers out there. It's a good looking wheel. They put a lot of effort into it and the manufacturing is nice, but it's not a fast wheel. So in my mind, I, I, I kind of questioned that and said, why do you do that? You know, and that, of course, it's all, you know, about sales and bringing out something new. Uh, but if it's slower, why bring it out? I, I just didn't understand if it's not a better something, better product, why do it? And mm -hmm. so that's my whole philosophy on, on the wheels. If I, if I can't produce a better wheel, I'm not going to produce it. And so that's why I really enjoy that A5. It's 50 millimeter depth. It's, it has the a, a basically virtual uh, it acts like a virtual uh, 67 millimeter depth wheel. And so what happens is, you know, that, that crosswind stability really plays into it where you're not getting an affected by those crosswinds with that A50 because uh, it, it has a, a cam tail design, which basically look at any car on the road, it has that, that, that front 
uh, on the roof, it kind of it kind of radiuses down, if you will, and then it basically just cuts off square. Well, the wind actually thinks that your car is longer than that. And that's kind of the cam tail situation where you don't have to put as much material in there uh, to achieve the same aerodynamics flows. And so at that point, what's important with the bicycle wheel is one aerodynamics, but the other aspect is weight. So we just cut 12 millimeters of carbon in depth off that wheel uh, which basically brings the weight way down. Mm. And so it, it's kind of fun. And there's some other little tricks to it, like a, the airfoil, like the side of the, of the actual rim has a certain uh, shape to it that, that creates the, a, a, an airflow that, that is less disturbed, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I know this gets kind of complicated, but it, it's kind of fun. And I, I nerd out on this type of things. Yeah. So oh, cool. Yeah. It's fun. It's uh, fun to hear you talk about it, Chris. And it is so true that um, a bigger company can throw just a, a ton of money at marketing how fast the wheel is. And the general public, you know, will, will, will buy based on, uh, well, they say it's the best. So I should, I should try. I saw it on, I, I see it's front in front of my face uh, until you test it and hear an engineer talk about it, uh, do you know? And um, I have taken wheels into some of our local shops and they have with kind of raised eyebrows been like, dang, these are nice hubs. These, these are, I like how this wheel is a little bit wider on your, on your gravel set, et cetera. Um, so um, it, it's been fun to hear the feedback as well, Chris, from mechanics. Yeah, and that's that's one area we really uh, we really look at seriously is hubs, because that's where you know there's there's on our mountain bike uh, hub we have six poles on our road hubs we have four poles. So if you think about it, every time your rear wheel does a revolution, you know that those poles are engaging. You know they're 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 engaging. I'm not going to say a million times, but thousands of times per ride. And so if something that small and dainty on the inside of that hub um, can, can, you know, if something goes wrong, it's gonna go wrong. So you need to, and what I, I've done is I've invested and probably spent way too much on hubs, but it's my best insurance to, to not have any people, you know, have issues or problems. Um, Chris, one thing to pivot to just a little bit, you, you start out in, in with road wheels, 12 years ago, um, if there is a kind of a emerging silo inside of cycling industry right now, it's been the gravel takeoff. And then you, you come out with your G series, uh, wheel set for, for gravel and, um, um, man, those are awesome too. So how did you then kind of, is it tough to build a gravel or a mountain bike wheel as opposed or in conjunction with a road wheel and the science behind the different, you know, the science behind this is constantly banging on rocks compared to this is, con you know, this is going 25 miles an hour on a road. Absolutely. It's, it's uh, apples and oranges basically. So w when I sit down to design a, a, a wheel, I, I put, I bullet point three main things I want to achieve. So on a road wheel, I say, you know, depending on the road wheel, uh, the depth of it, I'll say like that A50, I said, you know, when, when we design it, when we hit, sit down with all the engineers, we say, I want it aerodynamic, I want it aerodynamic, and I want it, uh, you know, lightweight. Those are the three things. So flip over to, let's, let's call it just a mountain bike, because that's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. You know, my first thing when I look at carbon and you mentioned bouncing off rocks, carbon doesn't like sharp objects, right? And then couple that with low PSI, people like to run in their tires. Mm -hmm. it, it just sets up for a bad situation. So when we designed our X series, our X1s, you know, I looked at impact resistance, durability, and then I didn't even have a lightweight. I went with durability times two. So what we did was on that particular one, on the inside of it, we actually, at each spoke hole, we've actually uh, double butted it to where you don't see it on the, on the outside. On the inside, it's, it's nicely butted and adds some strength. 
And the reason we did that is to, to basically create more layers where, or add strength where we need it and, you know, take out the, the carving where we don't need it. Much like a, uh, like on your frame, if you, if you uh, thump your frame in the middle of the top tube, it sounds like it's a paper thin, right? But then you get next to the lugs, like the head tube and the, uh, the, the seat tube, it sounds really thick. Well, that's, that's because they have more carbon in those areas because that's where you need it. That's where the stress points are. Same thing with the rims. Um, so the other thing we like to do is look at other industries and borrow technology from them. Um, so this particular wheel set, this X1, we looked at the, air, the like airplanes, the airplane um, industry, and they were having issues with bird strikes. So when the, the 737s or those big jets were taken off, bird strike hits, it damages that carbon. It actually crack it, and then it, they'd, they'd have to take it into the shop and redo it. Well, they figured out a resin system that has, they call it more rubberized. It's, it's, it has a little flex to it. So whenever that bird strike hits that, that airplane, it just basically bounces off, doesn't crack it. So uh, one of the engineers we used on this X1 project he actually designs and builds drones as well for the military. So he had firsthand experience with, it and he's just like, and he's looking at it. And he's like, this is the resin I suggest you guys use. And it's more, a little bit more flexible, a little more, you know, um, rated to, to withstand impacts. Now, will it break? Yeah. Anything can break, but we, we, we like to, to, you know, basically borrow cool things that, 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 um, you know, outside the entry that, that, industry that no one's else, you know, no one's really thought about, or, uh, you know, we, we try to push the envelope with that, you know, if you will. Chris, yeah. when, when I hear, when I was a new cyclist, guys would always say, <clears throat> okay, your first upgrade on your bike is your wheels. Is that true? Like, is that the thing that I'm not saying that matters most, but how, how big of a difference does this make? Me personally, yeah, I'll, I'll upgrade wheels all day. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it is. So, and here's the kind of the, the back story on, on the upgrade, upgrades on the wheel. That was one of my wheels falling over. Um, <laughs> it didn't like what I said. The, uh, the, uh, when I it, it's a place where manufacturers can cut a lot of pricing or cost is a set of wheels. So what they do is they spec a, a cheaper wheel set, assuming you're going to upgrade that wheel set. Uh, much like Spencer said earlier, you know, it can sway a bike three or four grand, depending on what wheel set you get. And so a lot of the bike manufacturers these days will just spec a, a, a just an aluminum wheel with uh, straight gauge spokes and a, a heavy hub, probably a good hub, but it's just heavy. So, you know, someone that is going to do a lot of training. Yeah, that's probably okay. But you know, a nice set of carbons. It's lightweight. It's responsive. That that's the first place people uh, like to upgrade. So I like it because you know you drop, you know, basically about four, five, six hundred grams easily off a set of wheels. Um, you know, right off the bat. So your rolling weight is is dramatically decreased. Then the other thing is, um, you know, the the responsiveness. I mean that that aluminum rim you get it's probably what 20 millimeter 23 millimeters depth those spokes are really long so what happens is when you add a carbon that's let's say 50 millimeters depth you get a stiffer wheel set because one there's a lot more material there you know carbon being stiffer a little bit stiffer you know deeper but that spoke is shorter so it's less to bend that one millimeter or 1.6 millimeter spoke that's under tension so it's just an interesting concept so i always like when someone upgrades from an aluminum set of wheels to a carbon set of wheels and it's their first time ever you know stepping onto a carbon wheel i'm gonna i tell them i was like hey man this is gonna be just like you going from a uh like a hybrid type bike to a road bike it's that much difference you're gonna you'll notice it in the first pedal stroke mm -hmm. and you know and you know am i exaggerating maybe a little, but not much, you know? So in my mind, that's the best place you can do. You can upgrade is that wheel set for one weight difference, but then two, just responsiveness, man. It's, and they look cool. I, I like a nice set of carbons on my bike. Right. 
Chris, I've got a question for you. Yeah. So, you know, obviously the, the road industry has kind of changed over the last couple of years. I mean, I'd say when I first started in the road cycling, you know, industry started riding my bike, you know, 23 millimeter tires were kind of the standard, right? Well, now the last couple of years, you've heard 25 millimeter tires and now you're hearing, you know, 28 millimeter tires and you're having, you know, rim depths. I mean, I will full preface this. I ride the NV, you know, four or five ARs. So obviously the internal width is a, you know, a 25 mil, but I mean, now you're, you're seeing this progression of tires where almost like a 28 to a 32 is basically standard now. Right. So my question to you is, you know, being kind of the head guy at Mercury, do you see yourself entering into that world of maybe making a wider tire or a wider rim to fit that profile as the industry is, I feel like maybe is moving towards that direction of having a standard 28 millimeter tire or a 30 or 32 millimeter tire. Is there a direction with Mercury on that kind of side? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And, and we have been seeing that. Um, so currently, our rims are, our road rims, our rims are road specific rims. They can also be ridden on gravel because we like to overbuild our stuff and, and they'll withstand some abuse. But uh, currently our, our road uh, wheels have a 20 millimeter internal. And then on the gravel side, we've gone to a 25 millimeter. So it's a, a situation where you, you know, there's, there is some overlap. Uh, and when I say overlap, a gravel wheel can be used for a road application uh, for those wider tires. Now, with that being said, our current G1 is 30 millimeters depth, right? So you're not getting a lot of aerodynamic uh, um, advantages at all. But someone on this call may or may not have a deeper set of gravel wheels that will provide a little bit of aerodynamics at that 25 millimeter uh, internal width. And I, I see someone giving me the thumbs up <laughs> but and, and that's the other thing is I, I like I like people that get up at five o'clock in the morning and ride immigration and test out wheels. I mean that's that's it that's it that's the person I like and and the and and, and that's the reason I like you guys so much is man you you guys are taking on not only you know you know like having me on this podcast but you know you give me good feedback and I and I love that. So back to the you know the industry standard getting wide, yeah. Uh, the overall, you know, like a 28 millimeter, 32 millimeter road tire. I just haven't bought into that yet personally. Um, Cause I, I like to go fast. And, and the way I see it is the, the more surface you got on the, on the, the pavement, the lower that PSI, you're not going to go as fast. And those tires get heavy quick. As soon as you put more rubber on that, it gets, gets heavy. And if you really think about it, that's on the outside of your tire, outside of your wheel. So that is the most important rolling weight that you have on your bike. The lighter the tire, the faster, the least amount of effort you go. So I, I mean, me personally, of course, I'm kind of old school, uh, but I like, a, I like a 25 millimeter tire on mine. And I wouldn't mind going to a 28. I hadn't really tried it out yet, but I'll, I'll try a 28. But once you get into the 30s, you know, that's, in my mind, that's more of like a, a gravel type situation or a, or a, a, a guys like you that are are uh, trying to slow themselves down so a guy like me can hang with you. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I think that's a good answer. Um, I, I ride 28s um, on the A5s right now, and it, and it, and it does feel good. I, I wouldn't want to go wider if I was to get, just because it, it, it feels right, and it, you could go wider, but... Um, yeah. The other thing about that is when you're talking aerodynamics, that A5, we designed that specifically for a 25 millimeter tire. So once you go over 28, it changes that, uh, the aerodynamic flow or the airflow of that A5. Mm. So it, you know, it's, you know, it, it, it sounds kind of funny. You're like, oh, it's only, you know, a couple millimeters, but a couple millimeters makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, Chris, we, um, everyone experienced 2020, uh, in a different way from, uh, trying to get parts for their, uh, for their bikes, trying to get wheels for their bikes, trying to get bikes in general. So challenging, so challenging. And so now, now there's a flip side to that. Uh, 
the cycling industry, uh, as far as demand, shot through the roof. And those that were not traveling on vacation to on a cruise, they were riding their bikes. So demand went through the roof. And so talk about 2020 for Mercury. Um, was it difficult to get uh, your materials and to build your wheels? And did you see a, a strong uh, increase um, and able to able to keep up with the demand? Uh, that's, yeah, good, great question. Um, and of course, COVID didn't hit until about February. And the reason I remember that is because it hit China pretty tough in the Chinese New Year, which is, it, it kind of fluctuate on dates, but it was in the middle of February last year. And so once the, and, they, and the factory shut down for basically two weeks when that happens. And so what happened was uh, those workers never went back to work. In, in Asia. So they basically shut the factory down for February for like a holiday. And then China and everybody else in Asia basically shut state borders down. So you could not go from like, in our, you know, using it for us, Utah to Nevada or from Ogden to Salt Lake. I mean, they shut everything down. So nothing was happening. So there was a few months where I didn't have, I couldn't bring anything in, nothing. And, you know, looking at my, you know, historical sales data, it shows it. So, it, you know, I was way down in, in quarter two because I couldn't get any supplies in. I couldn't get any product in. But then right after that, it just blows up and everything's good. And so we ended up up last year a decent amount. You know, it's kind of, kind of a fun year. Um, and then on the flip side, uh, 2021, you know, because it, it's just kind of flowing into it, right? So 2020 and 2021, in my mind, are about the same because we're dealing with the same sort of thing. It's all about logistics. So sales and marketing, I'm not too worried about. And I've kind of taken my sales marketing hat off because I'm selling everything I can possibly bring in. Mm. What, I, what keeps me up at night, quite literally, is logistics and production in Asia. And so what happens is when we have our rims and, and hubs made, we have them shipped all over here to the U.S. and then we actually physically build them up, you know, in-house. And so to, to get that here, uh, industry, but every industry is having a boom on, on things. So aluminum is hard to get, you know, rim, the, the aluminum rim manufacturers are having a tough time to, to actually get, you know, aluminum billets. And then you have to talk about actual shipping. So, you know, we've, we've, the, the shippers increased. Uh, it's probably about two times the cost that that we're usually seeing, and so it's you know you do you adjust your prices with your your big customers or the end user. You know we've tried not to as much as we can, but you know it, the, our margins take a hit. But you know it's one of those things where it most likely will be you know uh, another year or so, so short lived, and so we're comfortable with staying you know the course with our pricing and not pass that on yet as long as we can so but logistics even getting a, a spot on a ship or on a plane to airship it's a pain you've got to plan way in advance Easy. and yeah and then lead times with factories like hub lead times you know they go from you know last year they were probably about 30 45 days right now it's six months out so there's no knee jerk hey this is a hot wheel i need to order more stuff mm -hmm. That ain't that ain't happening. You have to you have to plan well in advance. So that's what I, I that's what keeps me up at night. Yeah, is is the logistics. Chris, really interesting point on one thing. Um, we want to stay on. The materials are shipped to the U.S. here, but Mercury, mm -hmm. you guys, your team, you build the wheels um, here. And are there is that different from other wheel? companies that the entire wheel set is built overseas and then just sent here ready to sell. And um, I guess the end question is, does that help you with quality control on ensuring a dang good wheel? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, our builders here, I, I trust them. They, they, we build the old way. So it, it's, it's one of those things where we have uh, I like to call it, um, you know, modern technologies with traditional craftsmanship, because there's not that many people that still build a hand-built set of wheels here. They're, they're just, they're, they're just not that many. And so, you know, if I can ensure that, that remember five set parts to the wheel, 
you know, rim, hub, spoke, uh, nipple, and build. In my mind, the build is almost is one of the most important things about that. And so I I really pay attention to that aspect of it, and really um, I, I really like to to emphasize that part of it because most people don't even see it. So if you're looking at a uh, I'll pick on a like on Alibaba or AliExpress or eBay where you can go and pick up a carbon set of wheels for you know 400 bucks shipped to your house. You know, one, you might get a good set of wheels, but most likely you're not. You know, that rim, who I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust it because you know I've been to, I've been to factories over there where you look at it and you're like, you guys, th this is carbon. This isn't duct tape. I'd rather ride a duct tape rim than that. <laughs> so people are, I, I don't know. I, I get a little nervous when I see that. And then the, and then the, the build side of it, you know, it's. It, it, you know, they're, they're not putting, they're going to try to put out as many as they possibly can, not a good set of wheels out. And that's what I tell my builders is this. I was like, you know, I don't care how long it takes you to build a good set of wheels. If you put your name on it, that that's, that's on you. And they take pride in that. You know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of the times our guys will, they'll sign each rim bed with their initials and the date they build it. Wow. It's almost like a born on date. That's cool. Yeah. And yeah, and I like that. It's it's a it's it's kind of a a way we differentiate. Now, are there some other wheel wheel companies in the U.S. that do the same thing? Probably so, but you know, I don't I don't really worry about what they do. I like to worry about my side and the quality and and you know, back to the how can I build the best possible wheel for a fair price? Yeah, that is rad. Yeah, it's really really fun to hear the inside scoop on. And, and I think that having the, the last touch of the wheel before it goes to uh, the user is crucial in, in the wheel building process. So really fun to hear that. So um, uh, we can share with the team, Chris, what's, what's in the pipeline? What are we looking forward to? Um, I think we want to hear a little bit more about those fastest wheels being tested and, and how they're tested and, uh, and what's, what's coming this summer. What's, What's in the pipeline? What can the the team be excited about? You have a pair of A5s, which are 55 millimeter depth, but they they're a little heavy, and I'll admit it. You know, they we didn't we didn't hit the mark on the weights that we wanted to. So what I did was I looked at uh, how how do we decrease this? How do we how do we decrease the weight and decrease that rim profile? So we dropped down to actually 50 millimeter uh, depth. And they're gonna, I think we were able to drop, uh, it was about 100 grams, 150 grams per set, just by changing up the carbon layout uh, on, you know, basically how, how, how we're building the rim. Now, again, we overbuilt that A5 just to, to make it durable and, and because, it, you know, that was our first year, but um, I, I, didn't, I didn't really like that 55 millimeter depth. So we decided to go with a 50 millimeter depth. So it's, it's not gonna be a 100% climbing wheel, but it'll be a good at situ it'll be a nice wheel set when you're climbing uh, more of a shallow grade or if you want to like in a you're doing a time trial that's really windy you throw those jokers on and it's they're fast i mean really fast uh the next project that we're working on and i alluded to you know someone on the phone call may or may or may not have them is our g1 we'll most likely be going to a 40 millimeter depth wheel versus that 30 millimeter depth uh, adds a little bit of uh, arrowness, and then it also adds um, a little stiffness to it. Um, and it, 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 and I think, in, in my, of course, it's a guess on my part, but I think that's where the market is somewhat going, where a lot of the roadies and a lot of the mountain bikers are kind of dipping their toe into the gravel side. You know, it's it's one of those things where it, it's it's really neat. You're away from traffic. It's you know that uh, of course I'm I'm a roadie by, you know by you know, that's, that's what I do mostly, although I do mountain bike really badly, but, you know, but the gravel side really interests me. So I, I think it's kind of a situation where it's that peanut butter meeting uh, chocolate, you know, the, the perfect case scenario. I don't know. It's just a fun, it seems like a really fun uh, sport. And I think it's, it's not going to be a flash in the pan uh, like a fat bike. You know, it, it's going to be more of a situation where, I think road mountain bike will still be around, but I think gravel will take, will take a bit of their market share. And so, 
you'll you'll see more about that that G1. So I I think as a roadie, you know, I want more aerodynamics. You know, that's what I want. So that's what I figured that we would we would go to as a, a slightly wider. I'm sorry, slightly deeper uh, uh, um, rim profile. Uh, on the mountain bike side, we have a new uh, X1 coming out, and we're making it a little bit more durable, a little less uh, boxy shape, but we're still using this one material we call Fiber X, which you look at it, you see the difference. And what it is, it's basically, um, it's a, it's an absorbing or damping uh, material to where when you're riding your mountain bike and you, you bottom out and you hit something or you don't bottom out, it actually absorbs a lot of the, of the, of the uh, trail noise is what I like to call it. So it's a little more comfortable ride without sacrificing any performance. Um, and so that's what I went with, with that, along with that rubberized resin. So it's a, it's, it's a pretty nice wheel and the, the, uh, so we'll have that coming out and then I'm just starting a, a, uh, this is going to be the coolest wheel I think we've ever built. And well, for me anyway, and it's going to be, a uh, we're still running the depths of it, but it's going to kind of be similar to that 850 with that Camdale, Camtail design with the airfoil. So you're going to have no kidding, a climbing weighted wheel with about a 50 millimeter, virtual 50 millimeter depth aero performance. So you're talking about a one size fits all, that's gonna be a really cool wheel. So we're looking to get it around the, you know, carbon clincher around the 1200 gram, maybe a little bit lighter, most likely, depending on the depth, uh, but it has aerodynamic properties, which I don't know, that's, as a, as a nerd like me, I, I kind of, it's kind of neat when you can right. do a two like wheels in nerd. one. I like this nerd talk, Chris. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't get me in spokes, man. I re I'll really nerd Let's out. Do it. I want to hear. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Like if um, like from from the perspective, like I know from product research. I mean, how do your how does it stack up against other brands? I mean, can you can you talk about stuff like that? How do you mean? Meaning like, um, you know, we know, we, I, I, I don't know anything about, I don't know anything about what makes it good, what makes a, one better than the other. Um, so yeah. when you talk about how do they compare against each other, like products, build, materials, durability, safety, I mean, where, where do you honestly see your company s setting up or, or stacking up against others? Yeah, that's a, that's a fair and really good question. I'll be 100% honest. So uh, a lot of people make good wheels, you know, us included. So, you know, the envies, the zips, the heads, everyone makes, in, out, in my mind, outstanding wheels. And so you, you almost have to niche yourself. Where, you know, where in the market are you? Right. And so, you know, previous question uh, back when, you know, we first started, you know, there was a, there was only a handful of wheel companies. Well, for some reason, uh, Reynolds decided to go high end. Like they, they wanted to do battle with the Envies and the Zips. So that, that they, they vacated that middle section. Easton at that point got bought out, I don't know, like two or three times. So their wheels kind of took a, you know, took a hit. And I don't think they ever really came back. I think that's more of an, even a mountain bike line now. And so what I decided to do is just take that middle market. And I, I really, I, I kind of like that middle market because at that point in time, I could invest all my money into R and D building that best set of wheels I possibly could and didn't really uh, market that I was the fastest, the best, the most expensive, you know, that sort of thing. Right. I, I, I just tried to put out a good product. Uh, and so we, we started as a, as a, a I'm not going to say copycat brand, but, you know, kind of like a me too. We looked at what was hot in the market and we could react quickly. Um, so a few years ago, we decided to uh, continue on with that on some of our price pointed wheels. But what we've done is we've spent some money in R&D and, and really got after the science behind it and coming up with new and creative uh, rim profile designs. Um, like, for instance, the A50. Uh, that looks different. You know, there's a flat section to it. The, the sidewall has a weird 
you know, not a weird, but has that airfoil that you look at it, you're like, that looks a little different than all my other uh, carbon wheels. You know, even the Envies, which are a nice set of wheels, they just look different. And so we put some, some money into that. Uh, to where we're not really a Me Too brand anymore. I, I know I did it backwards. You're supposed to start with the, the really good stuff, really fast stuff first, and then kind of trickle down to some of the, the price point wheels. But uh, I, I didn't have the resources at that time. So I, and I, I do things a little different than most people anyway. So I, I don't mind it. So I know it's an uphill struggle to, to introduce the fastest wheels in the world where, you know, Mercury's known as more of a, you know, that middle, middle of the road thing. But you know, hey man, I, I I'm just gonna do what I do, and I'll just make better wheels. And if people want to try us out, great. If not, they can watch other people ride away from them that do have the Mercury. <laughs> That's money. <laughs> nice, yeah. dude. That's cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, good. Very good. No other questions for me, by the way. I'm done. Yeah, same. I'm Chris, excited. I got a, Chris, Chris, I've got a question for you. Um, you know, I mean. We talk about this, you guys hit in the middle tier. I mean, I'm, I'm just a curious from like an outsider perspective. I mean, are do you guys, are you guys using like the same carbon as like the zips and the envies of the world? I mean, like, is that what different, differentiates the different types of, of companies? Is, is it carbon or is it the spokes you're using or, you know, I mean, maybe shed some light on that. I'm just curious from a, just from an outsider perspective. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. So, um, the ca actual carbon, the cloth, is pretty much the same. Everyone gets it from two or three different manufacturers that are, you know, they, make it, they don't make it for just the cycling industry, they make it for every industry. So everyone uses the same carbon. The difference, and this is where the money is, is the actual resin system that, you know, the glue that makes it a rim. And then also the carbon schedule layup where, you know, the, you, you take, the carbon's just not all one piece. It's little swatches, right? It's like, um, you know, a two inch by four inch long length. And they, they, they put it together like it's a, like a jigsaw puzzle. And so that has something to do with it as well. So, but the, the main thing is that resin system. How good is your resin? You know, and that's, that is, you know, that's the reason the, the carbon clincher wheels from, from years ago would burn up. So when you're descending a big mountain pass and you're hitting the brakes, they, they melt, you know, so, you know, now they've, they figured out how do we, how do we raise that TG or that melting point uh, and still create a, a rim that can withstand impact. So with, everyone has their secret sauce with the resins, carbon fiber, it's just carbon fiber, as long as you use the, you know, ones from a couple different uh, factories in, in Japan. So it's, uh, you know, hmm. are you getting the same rim? Uh, yeah, yeah, as long as you stick with the uh, name brand, yes. Uh, and then the other part is quality control. How consistent can you make that rim? So is it, you know, the employee shows up and he's having a bad day? They're, they're still, all, these carbon rims are still all handmade. So it's, it's the consistency of it that is, is key. And so what we do uh, is, you know, we'll look at different batches that come in. So we'll have, you know, four or five containers come in each, each year and we'll pull a certain amount of wheel sets out and test them. You know, we look at, or I'm sorry, rims, you know, we look at it all, you know, it's just one of those things where I don't want a factory to tell us where they're using one type of resin and then switch up on you. And just so, just so they can save a buck, you know, it's one of those things. So you know, the, the good part about it is as long as you use certain factories over there, you're good. You know which ones to use, which ones not to use. Uh, if you want to put out a good product, if you don't care, if you're charging that $400 wheel set delivered to your house, man, they don't care. They're just looking, I want to make 20 bucks off this wheel set and they'll do it because you're never going to talk to them again. You know, you might have a missing teeth because the, the rim folds up on you they don't care you know what are you gonna do email them and say hey i felt you know i, I crashed uh, hmm, interesting that's great feedback that's great really good very cool. yeah yeah and that's the same thing with bikes you know you see the, the 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 knockoff you know chinese frames and you can buy them for a couple hundred bucks all day but oh, i don't know man i wouldn't i wouldn't trust it 
Yeah. And I, I, I roll the dice, you know, I'm a dude that will take risks and everything, but there, no way. It's too much of a, I like my teeth. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, Chip, you want to, you want to wrap up? I mean, has anybody got anything else or, I mean, I would love to hear, I mean, Chris has kind of shared what's coming down the pipe. I mean, I don't know where else to go other than if you, anybody's got questions. Yeah, Chris, Chris, you've been fantastic. I think <clears throat> from the Medwelli side, we want to say thanks for, uh, Chris participated in um, our spring kickoff down in St. George, entered some really cool prizes in there. He's been super supportive um, to kind of give the Medwelli team an idea of what's in the pipeline uh, as far as our partnership with Mercury. I think that's an important piece. Chris has... Um, put together a plan where we have <clears throat> uh, two times per season, we'll offer uh, just a uh, knock your socks off type of deal on a set of wheels. And we just went through that uh, the first time during, it was through spring camp, many took advantage of that. And then uh, Midwelly gets a good discount uh, in general throughout the year. But then the next one um, will come right around, uh, you're getting ready for the fall. Uh, low digest season, et cetera, point to point. You're racing some of your gravel races. You want an upgrade on a wheel set. And, and Chris lays down the, the two week time frame of another good uh, promotion for Midwelly. So, Chris, from the Midwelly side, we want to say thank you for being a partner to the team and what you've provided um, for the team members. Not a problem at all. And my mind, it goes both ways. And, and I, I want to thank you guys for for letting letting me you know enter your family it's it's great and i'm looking forward to start riding with you guys and if you guys are really opening that kit uh order back up i'm gonna i'm gonna grab a set oh, it's, open. Grab a kit. it's open it's open you got oh it's it. open i don't <laughs> have the i don't have the link <laughs> we'll send it I chris send is gonna it. look good yeah chris thanks so much man we really appreciate you and uh look forward to riding with you you bet my pleasure Thanks, Chris. All right, see you guys. See you later.